Our presentation today. Thank you for joining us from all around the country. I'm Sarah Falkowski. I'm the Education Coordinator at Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve located in Naples, Florida. And I'm here with a whole panel of my favorite colleagues to share with you the experts and filmmaker behind the Mangrove Coast. So first I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do here. So let me share my screen with you. And I want to welcome everyone to National Estuaries Week. This is a really special celebration that's taking place at 30 locations around the country. We're located right here where number 18 is in Southwest Florida. We are at the, on the edge of the Everglades bordering the Gulf of Mexico. And it's so great to see so many familiar names in the audience. You know that you're in webinar format, so we can't see you and we can't hear you. But in just a moment, we'll tell you how you can communicate with us. Here at Rookery Bay, we manage 110,000 acres. So we encompass everything within this yellow boundary right here. So this area here, we go around Marco Island, Cape Romano through the 10,000 islands. And down here is where we border Everglades National Park. So now I wanna take a moment to show you a clip, just 30 seconds from our documentary 
called Mangrove Coast that currently airs on PBS. And then we'll begin with an introduction of all of our panelists today. Bay National Estuarine. Estuarine Research Reserve is about active partnerships and long-term preservation. Scientists and business owners, citizens and government officials, educators and researchers, tourists and locals are all the stewards of Southwest Florida's mangrove coast. so much for that. I'm now going to turn it over to Jessica, our Coastal Training Program Coordinator, for a little bit of housekeeping and introductions. Jessica? Hey, thanks, Sarah. I hope you all enjoyed watching that short little clip with all that beautiful footage. Um, before we get into hearing more about the documentary, in case you're not familiar with Zoom, I'll tell you real quick kind of how we're going to interact today. You do have a chat box in your controls where you can let us know if you need any help, if you're having any difficulty hearing or seeing things. And if you have any questions for our panelists today, there's a little box that says Q&A. So you can enter your questions in there and you'll be able to see the questions that other panelists have. And you can do the little thumbs up or you can upvote those questions that you want to hear answered. And that's gonna help us at the end of the webinar today, we'll have some time to take questions from you in the audience for our panelists to enter. So as you're listening to the material that they're talking about, if you have questions, put it in the Q&A and maybe we'll pick your question to answer live here on the webinar today. So other than that, today's gonna be pretty simple in the webinar. You can just sit back, relax, and enjoy listening to all the great stories that we have from our panelists. So I'm going to go ahead and let you know who we have in the webinar. And I'm gonna go around to the panelists. I'm gonna change things up a little bit. Elam, we'll have you go last. So first, I would like to have Marissa just introduce yourself, let us know who you are and which unique perspective you're bringing today. Hi everyone and welcome. Um, I'm so happy to be here today. I am the Coastal Training Program Specialist at Recurry Bay. So my role um, at the reserve is to help bring that science to those professionals in our community. So today I'm going to be bringing a perspective of once an intern now into a um, um, one of the representations of the reserve. So I'm thrilled to be here today. Great, thank you, Marissa. Um, next up, we will have an introduction from Ethan. So Ethan, let us know who you are at the reserve and what perspective you're bringing to the panel. Hello, everybody. Ethan Barkukas. I'm the executive director of the nonprofit Friends of Rookery Bay that supports the reserve. Uh, and we do that through four main areas and the outreach and the advocacy piece, I think is the, the, what I'll be talking about most specifically today, but uh, volunteer recruitment as well as fundraising are critical components to the Friends. And uh, my background, so you know, was actually I was a fisheries biologist and researcher went into the environmental nonprofit world and then uh, had a vacation down here in Naples and a chance to kayak in Rookery Bay um, in uh, 2016 and absolutely fell in love with the place. And uh, the stars aligned and now I have the opportunity of merging both, both my professional paths into uh, protecting such a really, really special place. Great, thanks Ethan, such a great perspective to bring to us. All right, next we will have an introduction from Keith, if you can tell us kind of who you are at the reserve and what you're bringing to the panel. Hi, my name is Keith Lockinen. I'm the manager of Rookery Bay Research Reserve. I work for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, and I'm also the Southwest Regional Administrator for the uh, Southwest Coast. Um, and I think the perspective I'm bringing is, is from that sort of management standpoint. Um, I'm lucky enough to work with 30 really, 30 plus really talented uh, coastal individuals who just work so hard, along with volunteers, stakeholders, and so many other people. And for me, being here is, is a real honor because I actually was the stewardship coordinator at Rookery Bay from 2005 to 2007. So I left and came back as manager. And so I think I have a whole new appreciation, not, not that I didn't appreciate it before, but now, especially being here and, and seeing, you know, all the dedication that goes into protecting the reserve. Great, thanks Keith, the perspective of the, the manager, kind of the boss of the reserve. 
Um, so next I'll have Ryan introduce yourself and let us know what unique perspective you're bringing. Hey everybody, excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Ryan Young. I'm the founder of Rising Tide Explorers and we give biologists and science professional led eco tours around the reserve with kayak trips, boat trips, kayak rentals, and lots of other cool programming. And we're now the exclusive eco tour partner of the Friends of Rookery Bay. So all the activities we do in the reserve uh, helps to generate funds for the Friends of Rookery Bay in support of the reserve and all the great stuff that they do there. Um, so I think the perspective that I'm bringing today is kind of uh, how the health of the estuary really impacts business, local business, and also how developing those connections between, you know, our visitors and our residents to the reserve through these unique experiences with really qualified individuals uh, really helps them develop a relationship to this place and uh, increases their ability to be good stewards of the Rookery Bay. Great. Thank you, Ryan. So some um, perspectives from our panelists. And next we'll have our featured speaker, the filmmaker himself, Elam. If you want to introduce yourself and then just roll on into the discussion you're going to have. Thank you, Jessica. Well, it's a real honor to be here with this group. This is Rookery Bay has been uh, one of my favorite clients. It's not like you have favorite clients, but because it's been such a long relationship, I think it's been almost 20 years that I've been coming in and out there. And have been a part of so many new ventures with Rookery Bay, um, such as when you have the concept to, to build an educational learning center. You know, I walked on that piece of property and when the director said, this is where the new center is going to be and having the opportunity to interview a lot of the great heroes that are no longer here, such as Dr. Bertie Yokel and the list kind of goes on, George Wilson and those kind of things. And so you know, in a way, I'm kind of your keeper of these treasured stories and and to be able to collect these videos and and the audio interviews and the stories and to be able to come back and to serve Rookery Bay has just been an incredible honor. And every time I'm part of these programs, of course, this is a new one for me with doing a, a, a virtual Zoom conversation, I always learn more than than what I give and I'm sure today will be the same. So, uh, you know, storyteller is how do you frame what's going on? And so that's what we're gonna to try to do today is just kind of maybe a retrospective view of what were those early dreams back in the 60s and what propelled it forward and those many little steps, you know, how'd you get from, what was it, six acres was the first buy to 110, thousand. I mean, that's amazing. And you did it in 40 years. So uh, Keith, I'll start with you. And I met you first time in, I think it was 2002 or 2003, when you were working up at Crystal River. And at that point, uh, you were uh, a biologist there and you were the boat driver and we went out to do a dive on a really, really cold day. But I remember we got some great shots. Um, so it's great to be back with you. And now, uh, so now here you are, manager of Rookery Bay, and that's a good example of what I've seen many people in the DEP over the years, how you move forward with your career. Um, one thing about you scientists, you're always, always trying to learn something new and better and trying to invent something. How can you use this knowledge? And, and that's what you've done. So it's great to watch you in your career. So tell me a little bit about what's uh, happening at Rookery Bay. What's your mission? What, What's going on these days, Keith? Well, 2020 has been challenging, as, as we know, as we know for everybody. But um, it's it's really interesting knowing that um, even with all challenges this year and COVID and other things that that our biologists and our scientists are still out there working. We still have folks out there protecting sea turtles. We still have folks out there doing water quality, um, taking care of invasives, doing um, working with our volunteers who are so um, into what we do. Um, and just are really such a part of the reserve. And while we haven't had the face-to-face -face work together time, you know, we've been really lucky to use formats like this to continue to connect with people. And so um, while it's been a challenge, you know, it's still, our, our mission is still the same. We, ha we have a mission statement and vision and, and they're, they're wonderful to read. But, uh, you know, for, for me, it, the mission of Rookery Bay is all about connecting people to the resource and getting people to understand, you know, 
the value of Rookery Bay, whether that's just intrinsic value, it's beautiful to get out there on sunrise, you're fishing off Key Waden, you're catching snook, you're watching birds, you're kayaking, those things, but also, you know, getting folks to understand a little bit of the science, science involved and how they can be part of being really stewards for the environment and stewards for Rookery Bay. Um, we really want to get folks involved because we can't do it all ourselves. So, um, you know, all these, all these different times and formats, we're still really, you know, trying to do the same thing just in different ways. I think one of the key words that you mentioned was connect. And of course, 2020, that is a major challenge. So tell me just briefly, what are some of your wins and what are some of your losses of what's happening this year? Of, you know, how are you connecting to the science and to the resources as well as to the public? Wins and losses. Yeah, so one of our interesting wins is um, is being able to take people virtually on some of these field trips, um, you know, from the trawls we we're doing this week to actually, so the general public has a, you know, has a ringside seat at seeing what our scientists and biologists do in the field, you know, which, which I don't think they ever have unless they, unless you actually sign up as a volunteer or go out with us, which we always encourage people to do, but being able to really see that firsthand, I, I think is a, is a really neat opportunity. Um, you know, and as far as the losses, you know, my dad always told me, you know, not problems, just opportunities is, is really, um, you know, we'd love to get, you know, folks in the door, you know, uh, to see the ELC and, you know, as soon as it's safe to do so, we will, but in the meantime, just to continue to offer, you know, offer, you know, so much insight and opportunities, whether through the Friends of Rookery Bay or volunteering or just learning a little bit more about the reserve, I think. Um, you know, it's been a challenge, but I think we, we st definitely still have a lot of wins, judging just by the number of people who are signing up for these uh, webinars. It, it's been amazing and honoring to see that. You know, one of the roles that I think the documentary played with it, you couldn't have timed it better because it came out a little bit more than a year ago, and that was the 40-year anniversary. And I remember when we first started the discussion, uh, several people said, well, why don't you wait till 50? Well, that would have been too late, so you couldn't have timed that better. So, um Talk about some of the heroes. I've made reference to a few of them. And you, I'm assuming you've known some, I might know if you know all of them, but, but talk a little bit about the legacy of Rookery Bay and the heroes of, of some of the work they've done. And, and we continue to move this forward on, on their heritage. There were so many heroes, um, you know, from school kids who were saving, you know, their money to you know, the folks who started the Conservancy, but, you know, a couple of big names come to mind. One of those is Ted Below. Um, Ted Below is a well-known, um, he was an Audubon warden. Um, he did some of the first research in the reserve to really highlight how important Rookery Bay proper is for these birds and how important it was to protect these. He was out there on the water looking at osprey nests and, and pelicans and really, you know, was a really early advocate, uh, you know, for the reserve. So, you know, Ted is, Ted is a huge one. We've also had, um, you know, so many, you know, staff here through the years, you know, our first, from our first manager, uh, Chris Tempe, to, you know, the guy who I'm lucky enough to fill after 29 years since she was Gary Litton. You know, it, this is definitely um, a big deal to move this forward. And, you know, all of our staff are heroes. We have some staff who've been at the reserve for over 20 years. And uh, they are certainly not here, you know, um, for the pay. They are here because they love what they do. And, it, you know, talking about people who are so dedicated that they really have committed themselves and their life to the reserve. I mean, you know, what bigger heroes can you get? Um, there's just been so many over time. Does anybody else have any other comments that you, of people you've worked with, some of the heroes of the past at Rookery Bay? Hey, well, I can dive into some of the key heroes back in the 60s if you want to do that now or wait. Go ahead. Yeah, it'll connect. So tell, tell me what what's your connection? What do you know? Uh, share about that, Ethan. Sure. So when I moved down here three years ago, I had actually asked Gary Litton, who was the director for 29 years, who would be the, the couple uh, community leaders that are a must for me to, to meet in those first few months to helped me in my position understanding the friends and the reserve and the value. And uh, Laverne Norris Gaynor, uh, who is now 96 years old, was the number one person on that list. And I had a delightful afternoon uh, with her, uh, learning about the history of her family and her parents and, and the role that they've played because 
if not for them and, and grassroots efforts, this panel here and all of us would not be around because Rookery Bay would be a developed property. So, uh, and I can dive into the history in a little bit, but Laverne Gaynor and that family is certainly a, a hero to uh, Southwest Florida. It sure is a great story because what, what, what was it, 60 acres or six acres? What was that first buy that of the land that they bought? 1,600 acres. Oh, 1,600? Okay, well, I'm dyslexic a little bit, so but I had the six right, okay? <laughs> um, Ryan, you talk about that a little bit. You're out there every day and you get to see all these pieces of the, of the puzzle that were put together and, and, and created this wonderful, uh, you want to call it playground or uh, sanctuary, a place where people love to go. Share a little bit of your insight on on day to day work that you see. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I have the greatest office imaginable. Um, I'm out in this 110,000 acres of beautiful pristine area uh, that I can share with other people on a daily basis, and uh, it's unbelievable. I, I'm out there, you know, nearly every day, and I can say that I see something new all the time, and we're always learning something out there. Um, just having the opportunity to bring people into this place and, and go, going back to the, the heroes that you were talking about, you know, I, I got involved with the reserve about 10 years ago and uh, I was under the mentorship of Gary Litton, who was, uh, you know, a mentor of mine and uh, such a high level of respect for him. You know, he, he made a lot of great things happen for the reserve, uh, you know, the, the learning center and then Randy McCormick, who, who launched the initial EcoTour program and then eventually passed the torch to, to us. And uh, he helped get the paddle park built, which was a, a junkyard, basically, that they turned into a place to access some of the most beautiful parts of the reserve and give thousands of people the opportunity to establish that connection and be able to see and experience these places, um, you know, which to me is so important, I think. Yeah, and I'll come back to you a little later, Ryan, but I want to hear some stories of comments of some of the people you took out. But coming back to you, Keith, uh, so uh, what, what, if you had a crystal ball, what's the future gonna look like for Rookery Bay? I think the future is, is more important um, than ever. Um, certainly places like Rookery Bay would not have, would not exist if, if people hadn't stepped up with one voice and said, we want to protect this place and to have, um, the state of Florida and NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, our federal partner, helped fund these purchases of land. And unless these lands were purchased to protect the core of the reserve and protect these really special places, we really wouldn't, you know, exist. And so, you know, at over time, I think, you know, 50 years into the future, Rookery Bay is, can, is going to continue to be this really diamond in the middle of Southwest Florida um, at the edge of 10,000 Islands where you can come out of Naples and Naples Bay and those <clears throat> beautiful houses and, you know, million dollar houses. And within 20 minutes, you are a thousand years in the past. And, and I think that's the real value of the reserve is, is getting people to see what Florida looked like, you know, before, before um, we really got here. And it is, it is a, you know, transport to the past. One of the things that I've always enjoyed, and I did this with you several times, Keith, and also some of the rest of the team, is when you put together groups of politicians, whether they're uh, state legislators or, or U.S. congressmen, local county commissioners and school teachers and all these different people, and you take them out there and you show them firsthand. Um, it's just amazing how, you know, it's like you watch the countenance of these people's faces. I mean, within minutes when they get on their boat and they go out there. Talk a little bit about maybe even just jump into policy a little bit. I know sure some of it may have been intentional what you're trying to go for, but that interaction of, of taking people out, uh, and I'm thinking mostly of politicians or decision makers, and you give them that firsthand experience. Y'all have done such an incredible job on that. And I think y'all can talk about that. But let's start with you, Keith. Yeah, you know, it, it's really fascinating because the first time I, I, I found out I was going to be on a boat with a potential elected official or their staffers, you know, I was a little bit intimidated until I get out there and I realized that Rookery Bay is apolitical. You know, there, there's no political party. People people just love the reserve. Um, you know, we've been honored to have, um, we did a trip for Representative Mario diaz Ballard, and man, he just, he loves this place. And he has a picture of Rookery Bay up in his office in DC. Um, so it's, 
as soon as you get them on the water, they, they just instantly get it. They instantly realize it. Um, it's, you know, it's so much easier to translate science into policy when somebody can get out there and, and they can hold a bandage, you know, that they just caught in a trawl or they can see a roseate spoonbill or they can see these things. And so those oper that's really just an opportunity to get these folks to engage a little bit more so, so they know that we're not just a, you know, we're not just a line item in the budget, you know, we're a real place with real people and important habitats that, you know, some dedicated people are working on, not just reserve staff, all the partner agencies, volunteers, so many others. And Nathan, very similar with you, but you also really reach out to uh, local businesses, communities, partnerships, and of course you, you try to encourage them to give because that's what makes it work for you. And you're 501c3 and you have done an amazing job to build those bridges and, and create those partnerships. So uh, can you talk about some of your successes and the efforts that you have to continue to build this for the friends? Sure, I mean, as I said in my intro, one day just exploring our mangrove coast changed my life forever. So uh, that's one impact. And uh, when, we, when we hold our annual fundraiser, our Bash for the Bay, you know, a lot of our auction items are, are live experiences in Rookery Bay because you can't get that anywhere else. Uh, and I mean, the folks that go on them, I mean, I go out with them, you know, their faces just blown away that this is in their backyard. Uh, a lot of people didn't even realize diversity of, of birds and other wildlife and, and the value. And so, and then the partnership that we have uh, worked on with Rising Tide Explorers, you know, previously our eco tour program was only six months. Uh, we now have expanded it to over a year so we can get so many more people onto the water and let them see firsthand uh, why it's important to protect it. And maybe they're going to volunteer or become a member or donate, however it resonates with them. But uh, uh, if you haven't been on the water, definitely come out with us. Yeah. Ryan, you want to follow up on that and uh, share some experiences of what people said and, and what you heard? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll echo what Ethan and Keith just said, and, and you said it too, when, when you see somebody's face when they're out there and they experience something that they never have before, or even if they have, and it's just every time you go out, it's a new experience. I mean, you know, we find all kinds of cool critters out there. You, you find a, a horse comp that's two feet long and you hand it to a five-year-old kid. Uh, <laughs> that is the most incredible face you'll ever see, and it makes every minute of work worth it and um you know an experience like that can change the trajectory of of somebody's life I, I know it has for me um and for Ethan he just said being out in Rookery Bay changed him and for me I moved to Florida in 2004 kicking and screaming in the middle of high school uh thinking that you know from the northeast I'm moving to a big swamp with toothy reptiles in it um and I came to realize upon one of my first outdoor experiences uh, with my high school marine science class to Rookery Bay Reserve. Got to go out on one of the mullet skiffs and do a trawling trip and we pulled up all kinds of cool critters and and it was an unbelievable experience that made me say uh, maybe Florida isn't so bad after all and uh, now I'm here able to share those same experiences with other thousands of people every year and also help contribute to the education programs of Rookery Bay, which was the very same programming that inspired me to uh, go down this path. So, you know, it's, it's a super valuable thing to be able to have this place and give people those experiences because it'll support itself uh, in bringing passion to those people about these places, I think. And plus you got a cool job, Ryan. <laughs> you get to go out kayaking almost every day. Yeah, it's so cool. I have to think about what uh, Dr. Rio Wilson talked about. He said, like, you know, within all of us, there's this innate desire or, or we know that we want to take care of wildlife or our habitat or things around us. And I always remember uh, one of my clients up in Northwest Florida, uh, MC Davis, has an educational learning center. And he would always talk about the when you have children and when they see wildlife or they have an animal and they look in the eye until you touch it and look in the eye, then you change them forever. So I'm gonna to talk to you, Marissa, because that's what you do. You get to work with kids. You got a really cool job. I know you're new with it. Um, tell me about what, what's going on in your department. 
So I'm actually in the, uh, the coastal training department. So we work a lot with uh, professionals. So we bring in um, typically in the uh, days before the ELC was closed to the public, we had tons of groups coming in. If they were um, landscapers or city municipal staff who are coming in to learn about mangrove trimming or fertilizer use, or if we would be bringing in um, other groups to learn about um, uh, even communicating to the public if we're talking about water words or anything like that, that we're trying to engage with the public. Uh, we're able to bring those groups in especially to somewhere like the Learning Center and show them this wonderful resource that most of them had no idea when they just clicked to register for a class online that this is the destination that they would be learning all this science-based information from. And the really cool thing is, is that we've been, we've had the opportunity to get these people who normally wouldn't come to a facility like Rickery Bay when they're, you know, maybe they were closed, you know, once they get off of work or on the weekends, they weren't able to visit. But these individuals were able to come to the learning center, get to see the exhibits when they are walking around on a 15 minute break or a lunch break and get to see this stuff to bring it home to their families and say, wow, I went to this really great place. And then they're able to bring their families back to the learning center to find out mm -hmm. all the mysteries of the estuary. So for us, we don't work directly with the kids, but my goodness, it's such a great link to these to these folks. If we're able to get the attention and capture the heart of the parents who are able to come here, or the you know the cousins, or the you know the uncles, the aunts, you know anyone like that, to be able to connect those two. Yeah, very good. Okay, so you kind of got an overview of what happens at Rookery Bay, and this is for the general audience that's listening right now. So. Start getting your questions together and start posting them and we will address them as you go on because we, we've thrown a lot of ideas and different things out there. So Marissa, we briefly talked about children and I'd like to hear somebody talk a little bit more about the programs you had for, was it three different counties, uh, Collier, Lee, and I don't know what other counties that come through in that program you have. How many kids have you run through Rookery Bay over the years in the Educational Learning Center? Can somebody address that? I think, uh, Keith, I think you might have a better answer for that one than I will. So um, we probably do have the statistics somewhere. We, we uh, keep lots of statistics, but I can tell you for at least Collier County, um, between the fourth, seventh, and high school classes, um, it's, it's pretty much a guarantee that every Collier County kid who comes through uh, Collier County schools during their scholastic career is going to come to the reserve at some point. Um, and also there's kids from Lee County and other places, but what's, what's really fascinating is say when we get a kid from, you know, um, Immokalee or someplace who's never been to the coast, who's never been on a boat, um, and to see, you know, that, that look in their eyes, it's like, wow, it, it really, you know, it really opens their expectations, even though they may have lived in this county their whole life to really get down and, and see that. And certainly some of these kids who come through, they end up coming back working for us. Um, you know, we have one of our education team, Janine Windsor, she was one of those kids and she now works for the reserve, you know, as an education person. Um, you know, me as a kid, I was cleaning out my, my, um, my room as a kid uh, with my parents a few weeks ago, and I found a poster of Rookery Bay, and, and I, I forgot I had it there, and I was like, wow. So, I mean, wow. Rookery Bay has, yeah, it, it, you know, I got a little emotional. I was like, I, I forgot that this was here, but uh, so I think Rookery Bay has been a part of, you know, school kids and what they, you know, know and understand for a long time in South of Florida, and Lee and Collier and Charlie counties, I think people really know what the reserve is, and we're just lucky to be able to have a chance to educate kids. I think many of us have a similar story. You know, for me, it was back in the mid nineties when Bolton Dracca took me out there to what was called Key Wade Island then. And I fell in love with it. I mean, I left part of my soul there and it's still there. And so, uh, yeah, you get to you get to learn those nuances and it's just an amazing place. And I'm so glad it's protected and you all do such a wonderful job. Ryan, you got a comment on that? When you see, uh, kids, families, what are some of the things that people say, why they keep coming back? Well, you know, uh, Southwest Florida is a, is a destination for people, uh, regardless of whether they know how special it really is. So, you know, people come here for the beach, they come here for golf, they come here for the resorts, they come here for the, the climate and the temperature. And 
I think it's really special to have the opportunity to realize why they should really be coming here. You know, the, the families we get, and we get families all year. Um, we get, you know, K to gray, all ages. And um, it's part of our mission to share what we feel like the best parts of Southwest Florida are, which, you know, is Rookery Bay, the crown jewel right here. And our slogan actually is you, you can't see Florida from a lounge chair. Um, so we try to encourage and slightly shame people into coming out with us because when they do, when they get back, they see this place entirely differently. And, you know, from, from a, a mangrove, for example, the, they come out and they see a bunch of trees and they don't know the background or the story or their adaptations that they developed over eons for survival in this really unique place. And when you explain it to them in a simple way, they come to realize how unique this place really is. And I, I can say that this year alone, we've, we've taken out over, over 3,600 individuals, um, which it exceeds last year, actually. So every year we're getting the opportunity to introduce more people to what makes Southwest Florida so very special and give them those experiences from little kids to adults who, who really don't know what makes up Southwest Florida and older people that have lived here for years and haven't had the opportunity to get out. But when they do, everything changes for them. And that's, you know, that's what happened to me. And I love sharing that with, with other people. Just a quick question, because when you start out, you were only doing the winter month, correct? So what have you been doing and, and how are you engaging people to do a year round uh, tourism now? How do you do this? Well, I would say that, you know, things are changing in Southwest Florida. Summers have been getting busier and, um, you know, Rookery Bay ran um, the EcoTour program under Randy McCormick for about seven years um, and it was seasonal and Randy had a great team of volunteers and, um, you know, they were able to run, you know, two trips a day and get, um, you know, lots of people out on the water and it was wonderful. And um, it just so happened when we, when we made the transition and Randy kind of passed the torch, um, we had founded Rising Tide in, in 2016. And it started off with, uh, you know, $50 in one kayak. And, um, you know, as Southwest Florida is a tourist destination, we've been able to grow to have a staff of uh, somewhere between 20 and 30, depending on the time of year. And we have, you know, 70 kayaks and we're able to run five guided trips a day on kayaks, three to six boat trips, kayak rentals, giving lots more people an opportunity to get out there. And um, I think part of it is our staff is science professionals and, and graduate students, really, uh, you know, really overqualified individuals. But like Keith said earlier, nobody gets into science for the money. So it's a, a great opportunity for them to earn a little extra scratch, but also to share their passion and what they're studying with all of these people. And it kind of gets contagious, I think. You know, you, you bring a family or someone out that shares this three hours with someone who spent their li life studying these places and they, they catch the bug and then they tell all their friends. And so it's kind of given us more and more opportunity through the years to not only grow our team, which is the best team ever, um, but to take more and more people out. And, and recently we just got voted by USA Today, the, the number one kayaking tour in the country, which is, you know, super cool for us. And, you know, I attribute that to our staff because they, they're the best. It's really special. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank Marissa, you. tell me a little bit about your passion, your interest. How'd you get started? What's your connection to Rookery Bay, you know, aside from your job? Yeah, actually, my connection, similar story to even Ryan and as Keith mentioned, Deneen before, my first introduction to Rookery Bay actually came on a high school field trip. Um, wow. I was in Collier County as well. I went to Gulf Coast High School, which is right in the neck of the woods. And um, that was my, my kickstart to actually jump into a marine science field. So after I went to college, I came back as a passion to come um, intern actually with the stewardship team. Um, once I learned a little bit more with the stewardship team, they're the, the natural resource managers of the reserve, then I learned a little bit more about some of the research. So then I was interested and I started poking and prodding around saying, okay, well, I'm interested in this. And I, I had a fascination with 
um, what was called coastal blue carbon, which is a new hot, hot topic as well. And I just wanted to know a little bit more. So I asked the research coordinator, um, how, do, how do I start forming some questions on this? Because I would like to pursue a little bit of research in the future. And she got me partnered up um, with the Friends of Rookery Bay to support an internship where I can go out into the mangroves and start studying a little bit of the carbon budget. So because of that introduction, then I'm, I'm fully involved in Rookery Bay. And by the time that the coastal training program offered a position saying, wow, it's really important that um, we have someone, you know, training people as well in these different areas and trying to pull in um, those different aspects saying, okay, well, we already have someone who has been involved in the reserve. And once I heard about the job posting, I was like, perfect. I absolutely love Rookery Bay. And um, I, I always joke and say that they had to, um, they had to try to find a way to keep me here because I was so persistent <laughs> that it was going to happen eventually. So um, that passion that did start from years and years and years ago that I did, I was able to foster and grow uh, because of the, the wonderful um, peers now that I have at Rookery Bay. So because of that, um, we've been really able to um, continue to foster this kind of science community. And it was wonderful being a young uh, scientist, uh, being able to be mentored really into an actual career now because of a place like Rookery Bay. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Marisha. And I wish you all the best in a long career at Rookery Bay. And uh, Marissa alluded to something I want to ask you, Ethan, more about is a salary that's being funded by the work of friends. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that's important and why people need to get involved and support friends? Um, because it's, it's long reaching and you have a great impact on the science and the research. So talk about that relationship of supporting and funding salaries and, and uh, the research sure. that happens. Yeah. Uh, interesting. I mean, the history of the Friends of Mercury Bay, about 30, two years old, founded in 1987. And in its early years, it was all about the, the, the volunteer recruitment and the advocacy piece, uh, largely. The board was were the volunteers that helped support the staff. And then it wasn't until the recession, 08, uh, when the reserve lost a lot of staff members with state and federal budget cuts, uh, that the Friends stepped up into some, you know, much more fundraising because they had to offset and be able to fund positions and interns at the reserve. Um, and so they started an annual fundraiser and, and things have grown from there. And fortunately these past three years, uh, things have even strengthened more so. So um, uh, we do fund an education staff position currently and then multiple internships as Marissa had mentioned, she is one of many. So uh, those interns work closely in all the different departments depending upon the time of year. Uh, we have a sea turtle intern that's funded through our adopt sea turtle nest program, which is really fun. Mm -hmm. And then we're very generous uh, through a contribution by uh, Laverne Gaynor to establish the, the Laverne Gaynor scholarship specifically because of her passion and education. And so now for perpetuity, uh, we know regardless of the economic climate, we'll be able to support some of those interns at the reserve. Awesome, you know, the great work. Keith, uh, I remember when I was working on the documentary, one of the stories that really fascinated me, fascinated me was when I interviewed Ginger Heathcliff and she talked about the early steps of the coastal training program, which now I guess you run Marissa, but tell me about that little idea and then how it grew and now it's a national program. Yeah, so uh, we've been pretty lucky at, at Rookery Bay uh, to be sort of pioneers with a couple of these uh, with these concepts, and and one of them, uh, Ginger, who is absolutely an, an amazing person. She works um, for uh, Noah now in Silver Spring, and she came up with this concept of okay, we're, we're educating, you know, we're educating kids, we're educating the general public, but you know how can we reach people who are actually making decisions about the resource, you know? Um, and, and that includes realtors, realtors are coastal decision makers, uh, city planners, um, engineers for water management districts, all those folks. So if we can have some focused classes 
so that they understand that, you know, what they're doing has an influence on Rookery Bay downstream or what they're doing, you know, has a, you know, that if their client's buying a piece of property that has mangroves, okay, why are the mangroves there? Why are they important? You know, they're not just, you're not just blocking your view, but they're important for the entire ecosystem. So that, that concept of that coastal training program is probably one of the most defining niches of the National Estuarian Research Reserve System. Uh, I don't think anybody else does it quite like we do. And we have such a reach. And so that idea became what's called, um, called part of our core sectors um, in the research reserve system. So every reserve now, 29 in the system, have you know, education coordinator, stewardship, um, you know, research, and coastal training program coordinator. So we were very lucky to you know, get that off the ground. And, uh, and now you know, Jessica has been you know, picking up the reins of that um, very important legacy of those before her and, and continuing to expand and grow the program and certainly having people like Marissa on board who you know, came here and understand it, you know, getting them to really connect with those people is important. Great notch in your belt or feather in your hat, so to say. Uh, Marissa, another partner that's really key with you all is FIU. Um, that's Florida, in, uh, what's the I, International University? Is that what it is? Yes, that's correct. Uh, yeah, tell me about so, that partnership. Um, we, uh, so as Keith mentioned earlier, we have a federal partner, which is NOAA, right? The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. And then our university partner, we're fortunate to be partnered with Florida International University. So they actually support a number of salaries of staff like myself um, and Jessica and Sarah um, actually, I'm sorry, not, I don't think Sarah, but anyways, quite a few of us um, are actually supported by University of Florida. So because of this partnership, uh, not only do we have access to additional resources of that university, but they also help to support the reserve in that manner. So um, I know one huge way that um, we're so thrilled to be involved with them as well is that we, we actually just got a very large um, grant as well with one of their... Um, excuse me, one of their uh, leads is over in FIU. So because we have um, our affiliation with Florida National University, we were able to get the Science Collaborative Grant to link, um, I believe we're looking at some of the uh, hurricane impacts at Rookery Bay and joining it with another reserve in the Caribbean called Hobos Bay. So because of this project, it's um, or because of our connections, we're able to really expand out our reach and really um, transcend that um, information that needs to be out there. Excellent. Y'all have gave, each one of you have just shared some really great in-depth stories personally and how the, the Rookery Bay works and all the partners. And so we're uh, coming to the end of it, but I want to give each one of you an opportunity yet to kind of give us some concluding statements. So let's just go around the table and share what's on your heart. And then we'll turn this back over to Sarah and, and Jessica here in a bit. So let's start with you, Keith. So um, I'm a Florida kid. Um, I, I was born in Fort Myers. Um, I, some of my earliest memories were exploring in mangroves, probably up in Charlotte Harbor. Um, and I have always, ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to be a biologist. Um, you know, I didn't, couldn't picture myself doing anything else. And um, so I'm really honored to, to be here right now. And, and so one of the things that always keeps coming through in my mind of, of part of our roles in Rookery Bay is, is a quote that all conservationists um, know well. And it's, in the end, we'll conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. Mm -hmm. And I believe that is so part and parcel of what we do as a reserve. And um, Elam, you are part of that story. You are a conservationist just like us. And so um, I am so grateful to you, you know, for having worked with you on Living Waters, you know, but also here to tell this story because it is so important and it is, um, you know, it's just critical for our time in our state of Florida. So just passing that on. Well, thank you. In a way, I live vicariously through you, but I'm, I'm just the keeper and the collector of stories and reframe it and pass it on to public television. Um, Marissa, concluding statements? Yeah, I think um, for being able to have the privilege of being able to connect those pieces of, you know, a student um, and then developing into more of a professional, I think that, you know, it has been just such a wonderful opportunity um, to provide that, you know, information and to be able to share that kind of story. So I really appreciate being able to, 
you know, kind of opposite of Keith. I, I was not a Florida kid by any means. I grew up in the Rockies. I was in Colorado and skiing every year. And it was just such a different environment here. And just to fall in love with it and be able to pursue a passion, my passion now is just such a wonderful opportunity. Cool. And I can't wait to meet you in person because I've not met you yet, but we'll, we will one of these days. Fantastic. Ryan? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm echoing again, but what a great opportunity to be able to work in a place like this. And, you know, you're talking about partnerships and, and we have a really unique one that we're as we're kind of pioneering at, at Rookery Bay here again, where we've not only have our federal arm, our state arm, our nonprofit partner, but also now private business. And the, the reserve is just a, a major contributor to our local economy here and the health of it is really businesses depend on that and uh we're lucky to have this place protected and preserved because it's it fuels our local economy and i'm a perfect example of that and um you know as we establish this this new partnership uh we we hope that we're creating a model to not only you know, we're named Rising Tide because we want to raise the bar of ecotourism in the region by providing the most qualified guide staff around to share their passion about this place mm -hmm. with everyone who comes here, you know, maybe for the weather, maybe for the beach, uh, maybe for the resort. But then when they come to this place and realize how very special it really is, um, they're connected to it in a brand new way. And, you know, we want to share those experiences with people as much as we can so that they can help protect and preserve this place just like we work to every day. So I, I encourage everyone, if you're local, even if you're not, and you're heading down to this region, take the opportunity to get out with, with one of our nerds. Uh, that's what we call ourselves. But, but uh, you know, take a kayak trip in the mangrove tunnels, watch thousands of birds return to an island as the sun's setting uh, over the Rookery Bay, get out to some of the most unique cultural areas in the reserve by a boat, or rent one and go out on your own, you know, just soak it all in, have those experiences. And um, that'll help you really feel what we do and why we work so hard to protect this place. Well, I think you're well on your way, Ryan, you're creating a model for other people to follow. So you're writing the book. So cool. I'll wish you all the success in your future. Thank you. Aiden, I'll talk about friends and here's your, your uh, moment to, uh, <laughs> sure. Put in your pitch. Yeah, well, I would just uh, at the very beginning, I mean, Keith talked about uh, uh, the challenges we're facing, but that with COVID and although we're close to the public from our environmental learning center, uh, the outdoors is always open. And, you know, Keith and his staff continue doing all the work, the monitoring, the research, the conservation, which is critical to the ongoing and future preservation uh, of our coastal treasure. And so the friends of Rookery Bay uh, over these past six months working probably closer than ever with the reserve uh, to fill that gap with the shortcomings and the advocacy piece, the communication and everything we do with the website and social media. Um, but the future, there's a big question mark, you know, how federal and state funding uh, may be changing in the coming year with, uh, with, with COVID and what that has happened. And so it's really going to be uh, up to our friends uh, all of you out there to make the difference in in helping protect uh, this place now and and into the future. So whether it's volunteering or becoming a member, uh, giving monthly or even shopping online. One example of one of the opportunities with COVID, uh, we didn't have a, an online store before, and now we can get everything, including Southwest Florida's Mangrove Coast DVD, and all of that is really uh, investing in your local community. So. Um, those are my parting words, Elam. Okay, and that's it. RookeryBay.com, uh, .org, right? Org. <laughs> RookeryBay.org. Go there, and you can connect with each one of us. Well, I want to say thank you again to each one of you on sitting on the panel. Uh, my goodness, I, I learned more, and uh, about two months from, there, from now, I wish I was down there with you, so I'll have to get away here shortly and get down there again. So Jessica, I'm gonna hand it back off to you and you can handle the Q&A and, and the wrap up, but we all had a great time. Great, thanks so much, Elam. It was wonderful to listen to all that discussion. Um, so we have a couple more minutes left where we're gonna to get to some of the questions that you guys have asked. 
There's still time to um, submit questions in the Q&A. If you thought of something you want our panelists to answer live, go ahead and submit it. Um, but I've got, um, and also if you don't have a question, you can still go in and do the little thumbs up of what you wanna hear us answer. So um, a question came in from Anina and it's the top voted one. So we'll start with that. Um, and she asked Keith or if anybody else can chime in, have we shared any of the videos from the documentary, any of those clips um, with maybe the timeshares on Marco Island or anybody that's involved with tourism? So people know more about the reserve and once things open back up, they can come visit us. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure if we specifically targeted uh, timeshares, but I can tell you one, one thing of Elam's film, Part of it was actually funded by the Collier County Tourist Development Council to really show that side of it. So, um, so that, you know, that funding I think was important to talk about, you know, this as a place to visit as well. Um, we do have lots of programming that, you know, is virtual now on our website as certainly, you know, check out rookerybay.org. There's lots of, um, lots of places to learn and also sign up on our website for updates, you know, and if, and if you're in a particular condo or timeshare and you get an update from us, please share it with your rest of everyone in your timeshare. I would also just interject, um, we did distribute the, the DVD, the Southwest Florida's Mangrove Coast DVD to all the schools through their uh, marine science uh, programs. And so uh, the schools in Collier County have it, the local libraries have it, and then any residential community um, that wanted wants it uh, can ask and we can get it uh, for free over to the community's library. So the more we can get it out, um, the better. Okay. Great. Elam, did you have something to add to that? I uh, thought I saw you. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's a great way the Friends is really helping to support the reserve and get the work out there. Um, all right, so then um, the next question will be for you, Elam. Um, Janina asks, how long have you been working with the reserve? And maybe you can talk a little bit more about kind of that, that long partnership we've had. Well, the first time I came out to south part of Naples, I'd been in Naples, been in Fort Myers, but I didn't know what was in south part of Naples. Uh, no idea what was out in the estuary. But um, the story goes that I got a call from this gentleman, Bolton Drackett, and I, I lived in Tallahassee, North Florida. So this guy called and said, you need to come work for me. You need to come down here now. I didn't know I knew who Bolton Drackett was. And so I said, well, just hang on. Uh, I think it was December. I said, I'm going to be down there in February. He said, no, I'll get you a plane ticket. You need to come down now. And I said, sir, I, I can't right now. I'm involved in something else. So I said, okay. He said, when you get down here, he said, I want to see you. So in the meantime, I called... Uh, I uh, was the director of Corkscrew, Ed, I can't think of his last name. Ed Carlson. Ed Carlson. Thank you, Keith. And I called him. I said, do you know this guy, Bolton Drackett? Should I be talking to him? He said, most certainly. He said, you need to go talk to him. So I called him back and said, when I get there in February, come meet me out of the Corkscrew because I was doing some work for Audubon. And so he come out there and, and so he said, I want you to work for me. He said, I want you to make a video. I said, well, what, what do you have? So he started to tell me. He said, well, show me, I want to see this place. And so that was my introduction to Key Wade and Island. And that was back when he still owned it. And he put me up there in the camp in the old buildings and stayed out there on the tip of Key Wade for several nights. And it didn't take long. Like I told you, Keith, you just feel in love with it. And you let part of your soul there and you come back and you know, it just steals your heart. So this has been a long time. And then through Bolton, he introduced me to Gary Litton and I introduced Clyde Butcher to Gary Litton and all of us were having lunch together and that was when that was the birth of the, the whole concept of living waters we all were sitting there and said you know we want to do something of highlighting some of the the aquatic preserves because you know rookery bay is also an aquatic preserve so that was that was the beginning of that of a very important step of my filmmaking career was living waters because then that was my connection to pbs and and it kept growing ever since but uh that was a very very important conversation to have with Bolton Drackett, Bolton Drackett to Gary Litton, and then bringing Clyde Butcher into the mix um, really helped propel that career. And that was in the early 90s. I must have been like 92, 93, I think. Wow, long history. 
How neat. Um, there's one more, um, it's kind of more of a, a comment that I think we'll end with, and maybe this kind of ties into what Elon was just talking about, the history. Um, Elon, we've got a tip for you about perhaps a new documentary topic about um, Laverne Gaynor um, or her family saving a track of land from logging that's now the Big Cypress Bend Boardwalk in Fakahatchee. And this is from the, um, the executive director of the Friends of Fakahatchee. So I'm sure there's lots of interest from other groups in making documentaries like this and telling stories. Um, Keith or Ethan, I wondered if one of you could briefly just talk about kind of how did we make this connection? You know, how did we get this documentary made about Rookery Bay? Well, uh, how I got the documentary made was um, we were turning 40. I called up Elam and I said, Elam, let's make a documentary. And we both said, oh, we'll worry about how to fund it later. And uh, <laughs> that's pretty much what <laughs> happened. I had several staff who were like, how are we going to afford that? And um, it actually turned out that DEP actually had some funding for ecotourism. And so that is the funding that um, really, you know, got this film going. So we were uh, really grateful to the Department of Environmental Protection to funding, you know, a great deal of this film as well as uh, Clark County Tourist Development Council. And Noah, Noah put something on. Oh that. yes, Noah, absolutely. Yeah, I cannot forget Noah. Um, you know, their logo is on, you know, so much of what we do, and you know, it is a partnership with Noah. They, you know, they give us, you know, um, funding to look at local needs um, at each reserve. So it's a, it's a fantastic system and a fantastic partnership. So it always starts. On, it always starts with that idea. And then you kind of piece it together. So you're exactly right, Keith. It was an idea, and so let's let's pursue it. So Elam, how does this project fit into the one that you just finished up, aggregating all of the Florida films you put together? Can you talk about that? Well, uh, Florida Public Television about almost two years ago, we started having this this discussion. Uh, how can we design some kind of concept for pledge drives across Florida? And because I had eight documentaries, including Big Cypress, Everglades, Kissimmee Basin, Rookery Bay, Cal Drive, different places in Northwest Florida, and package this together and make it available to all the PBS stations as a pledge drive. Mm -hmm. So it's never been done before. 12 stations and to date five of them have used it now and are starting to raise money so that we put that together into the ATV, ATVDs is one gift package and as well as the books and uh, so if you pledge a certain amount you get one DVD or if you pledge more you get the eight box set or if you pledge more you get the books with it that kind of thing. So that's making its rounds but you know uh, Florida's got a lot more stories and this may be one. I don't know. We'll have to take a look at it. But, you know, for me, it's just like it is for many all. It starts with that partnership. When, like, when Keith and I first had that conversation, that was the first things we started talking. Well, you know, who else can we bring in here? Who's the partners? Where's the story? And you just start the discussion and it starts growing. Excellent. Well, there you go, Francine. Um, you can just start reaching out to Elam, you know, <laughs> start the conversation somewhere, say it's an idea as so you put it out there in the world. Um, so thank you all for your perspectives on that. I think that's gonna be all the time that we have for questions. So thanks to our audience for submitting some excellent questions for us to discuss. Uh, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Great, I'm just gonna share my screen one more time because I wanted to just give a shout out to partners. I, that was a word that I heard many times in the interviews today. And it's true, we cannot manage 110,000 acres with all of you and probably even more partners since this slide was created. So thank you so much. And to our partners in the audience, I wanted to invite you all, first, thank you for attending. It's so great to see our ages from, you know, kids to adults to senior citizens in this virtual programming. So thank you for joining wherever you are. And this recording will be available on our website. So I'll put that link right in the chat box. You also have the opportunity to join us for one more special event for National Estuaries Week. And that takes place tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern. And that is going to be virtual trivia. So we've tried it, we've practiced, and we're ready to go live with a thousand people tonight. So grab your device, your cocktail and your estuary knowledge and join the education team as we host virtual trivia. So we're gonna give it a try and hopefully this is successful and we can offer it at some sort of frequency.
attending today, your screen will ask you to give us some feedback. There's a link there to a survey that we so value your feedback. We've been doing a lot of these. This is my sixth webinar this week out of a total of seven. And we are so glad to reach so many audiences, but we wanna do it better. So as the pandemic continues and we don't remove, return to the office soon, we're gonna keep doing this kind of stuff. So let us know what you like, let us know what we can do better and share with your friends. So I think that's all for us. I'm gonna go back to the panel so we can say goodbye and thank you to everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Okay.